Hello everyone, I'm Lydia Ruth. Welcome to Homemaking Radio. I'm broadcasting from the manse and I hope that you are doing well in your current circumstances and have great plans for its improvement. I haven't been here for a while because I was waiting to be uh, younger and stronger and thinner and smarter and have my notes uh, organized and every room in the house in order and cleaned up, but I had to just put it all behind me. I realized that was not going to happen. I have so many things I've written down, though, while I've been busy, and I've had, you know, I've had the usual descendants descending on me, and uh, we've had a wonderful time. Uh, the older uh, boys that now have driver's license and jobs spent a weekend here with me doing things, repairing the roof. I had a drip, and I wanted to warn you about drips. I don't know, maybe you could twist it into something philosophical or very, um, very spiritual. I had a leaf from a table, from an oak table, that I had nowhere to store, so I put it on a wall behind a door and just left it there. It wasn't in the way, and I could easily retrieve it if I needed to add it to the table. And over the years, I didn't notice there was a drip in the roof because the table was soaking up all, the leaf was soaking up all the water. And when I finally noticed it is when I was in my uh, sewing room back there late at night, and there was a storm, and I heard this dripping I wouldn't have heard it because I was in another room at night and I heard this dripping and I noticed it, finally noticed it, and it had uh, created a big rut in this in this oak table leaf and I had the grandchildren come and they fixed that and see what else did they fix? They fixed the washing machine which wasn't working and uh, they fixed the, we had an ice storm as you recall and they fixed the broken pipe outside that was just spurting water. They found the valve and turned it off and fixed everything. They fixed uh, anything. They walked around with tools in their hands wanting to know if there was anything they could fix. So I had drawer handles that I had not put in that had fallen out or needed to be replaced. I had other things. I can't think of everything that they did and they worked on the computers and they just helped as best as they could and they checked all the doors to see if they closed properly and if we'd need a new handle or anything. It was so much fun. And they were only here, they only, it only took them a couple of hours and they got, uh, there were two of them and there were others uh, at other times, but these two, uh, around six o'clock I had given them a nice meal and I thought, oh, we're going to spend the evening together and we're going to talk and we're going to enjoy ourselves so much. And they got restless and said, that they wanted to go to the city. And I thought, oh yes, young people want to go to the city. So I asked him, I said, oh, that's okay with me, but uh, where are you going and what are you going to do? You know, I thought they were gonna maybe just kind of drive around and look at what's going on. They said they were going to go to every lumber and hardware store they could find. And so uh, just looking at new stuff, oh, they bought me a new plug for my bathtub, which, uh, I really needed and they bought um, some other things and so uh, but we did spend some time together making up a radio show and they I forget what we called them the fix it men because they were coming over to say we're coming over to fix you things and so I was started to sing a song the fix it men are coming like uh, the camels are coming <laughs> <laughs> so I invented this song, The Fix-It Men Are Coming, and after they got here, we started playing radio. And I would be the old granny, and I would call in, and they'd say, Fix-It Men, and I would say, This is your granny. Could you please come and change the light bulb in my ceiling? And, of course, we developed such a fun story uh, with this Fix-It Men thing, and it, it basically was that they decided they did not want to come out and fix anything. So what they would do is say, it would cost you hundreds of dollars to do that. Why don't you just get uh, a ladder and get up on it and get a light bulb and fix it yourself? And so 
they just well, it's impossible to get them to come. So they would always give advice, always tell you how you could do it yourself, but they would still send you a bill. We had so much fun with these characters calling in and uh, pretending to be to need help with something. And they would give the funniest replies. It was things like, I can't get uh, the door to shut all the way. And then they would give a funny reply. So we had a lot of fun together, even though they decided to spend one evening out uh, in the city checking out hardware stores. So ladies, I have a lot to talk about today and hope you'll be patient um, because I am vital now and I have been not wanting to talk unless I feel comfortable doing it. And that was one reason that put me off of coming. And um, I have been here so many times, I'm wondering if I have anything you would want to listen to anymore, but I'll just read my notes. And before you go any further, if you're new here, please don't watch this on YouTube because they have ads. And you could go to my blog where I have embedded this and I'll put the link in the description box. You go there, scroll down and I'll post it at the end of the post and there won't be any ads because I am making these myself on my on my own device and you are welcome to leave comments there and see what other people are having to say is interesting uh, because other people can see what women's response to being a full-time homemaker is and what some of the things they have discovered. So it's nice to interact like that. You don't have to. And I wanted to talk first, and I always do this, don't I, about your appearance at home. Because it's sad that it, way back, even in the 50s, people uh, were warning women, uh, women were warning women about being careful what you look like at home and to dress up and to look nice and you don't have to wear things that aren't wearable for homemaking. I prefer natural fibers, cottons and linens and denim uh, because they're so breathable and washable and uh, they're just, they don't, um, I don't like acrylics and uh, nylons and things, nylon and things like that too much. They don't make me feel good. But I wanted to talk to you about that because I'm starting to remember back in the day when we had cookbooks, recipe books, the beginning of the recipe book would often say, uh, first of all, um, get a good night's rest. The next day, dress up, put on a clean apron, uh, look at, get your hair uh, arranged in the mirror, look at yourself, get yourself uh, presentable for the wonderful and uh, integral work ahead. So I wanted to talk to you about that because there are some good videos. I just wa love watching the young women uh, enjoy housekeeping. They put uh, lovely videos with different effects on them. I just really enjoy them. Slow living and they put beauty around and they enjoy, you know, peeling the food and, and chopping it and cooking it and everything. But they're wearing um, things that are not as attractive as maybe they could be and I've been asked to talk about this I'm not trying to criticize anybody I went through a stage you know where I didn't want to wear anything but you know sweats and back in the day and then I realized uh, as I get more vital I can hardly stand it if I'm not dressed up and I don't even want to go out and pick a mint leaf off of my mint plant um, to make a cup of tea unless I'm dressed, unless I'm fully dressed, somebody's going to catch me out there, you know, and I don't even feel good if I start my prayers without being uh, dressed up, bathed and dressed. And I'll tell you some of the reasons why this is. As I've gotten older, I've been more self-conscious about that. But when I was a little younger and my children were uh, knee high to a grasshopper, as they called it, I realized what they're looking at from the knee down are my jeans or my sweats or I don't think we had leggings in those days and, and an old pair of shoes and I started wearing a skirt that had something pretty on it. I would go to the fabric store and get fabric from the uh, nursery department area that had little bears or rabbits or flowers or trees on it and so the little one would hang on to my skirt and uh, it made him feel good hang on to my skirt and he could he could hang on to it like it was his blankie, follow me around. 
and never let me out of his sight and hide behind it or whatever and uh, even fall asleep on my lap and he would be looking at this these little prints and I asked one time at, uh, we had a vacation Bible school in one of the churches we went to and I asked some of the teachers the women the lady teachers would you mind wearing uh, a long skirt because these little kids they don't see anything but your bare legs and your knees and they really need to have something that's dignified you know and I've always said that at home it's it's actually more important than anywhere else you would uh, work and uh, I will stop there and let you figure out things for yourself everybody has their own way of doing things and I'm I think everybody kind of has to figure out what works out best for them and one of the reasons I can only tell you why I do it why I because I want to feel good and I remember I told you about the cookbooks that we had where there'd be a little thing in the front that would encourage you to dress up and if I recall we also had way back in the 19 I believe early 1980s or late 1970s uh, now there were several uh, cookbooks that came out of uh, I would say celebrity type cookbooks of people that were promoting uh, homemaking and they uh, wore very pretty clothes and on the cover of the book you see them in a, a nice blouse and skirt and an apron as time went on and up until this time they're not they're not wearing that anymore but they tend to go with trends and we had uh, several of those things to to look at and uh, it encouraged us and uh, so one of the reasons that I do dress up is that I want to make the best use of my life and my time I haven't got as much time left as some of you and I want to um, I want to do my best I want to feel my best and I want to give it my best and I, I realize I'm starting a new day and I feel like a new person and you know I've often said well there's nothing new under the sun but you know we're new every day our every day is new and uh, you know we get new uh, new clothes or make new clothes and we also have uh, are creating a new record for ourselves like today I wore this and I'll remember that's what I wore today some of you have these little um, women's diaries or what were they called the day day women's diaries or something and it would have a little space where you could write what you wore what you're wearing now what you're going to prepare to eat and uh, just give give yourself a little um, journal and, uh, and if you're going somewhere or you're going to have an event in your house or something and someone might take a picture of you you'll remember that you wore that on that day for that particular event and in the, some of these books that we got in the late 70s and 80s early 80s there was one a particular one that was talking about hospitality entertaining what had recipes in it and it suggested that you dress to go with uh, your table setting with the colors on it you know choose an apron that kind of went with everything and or whatever you were wearing just kind of coordinate yourself with your kitchen or with your uh, with your tablecloth or whatever but the feminists and other people came along and said that's not intellectual is that all you women want to worry about is that all you think about well I still get that you know why are you uh, bothering to dress up at home and now I just say because it makes me feel good and everybody will understand that because we are in the feel-good era aren't we and everybody thinks that that is so important so that's a good that's helped me a lot and so I wanted to make sure that I was dressed so that I feel I feel positive it changes my attitude I want also I want to give the day my best I want to give it my best and there isn't going to be we don't know that we're going to have tomorrow ladies we don't know and we want to be our best for our children and make them uh, see that what we're doing is important and some of you that didn't grow up with uh, the grandmothers of the early 1900s late 1800s or the parents that 
even the ones that lived through the 1930s when there was so much poverty and depression, the mothers would still do their very best to look nice in the home. They had their, their dress and their apron and made sure they, uh, their hair was nice. And uh, even as poor as they were, everybody had a mirror. <laughs> so even if I, and now here's another problem I think we face as homemakers. And if you have something you need to do, uh, I want you to go do it. There's nothing to see here. Oh yes, my room. This is the ocean room. I It's just a little tiny room and I'm not sure what it was used for uh, when the house was first built, I think over back in the early 1960s, I think it was someone's sewing room. It was just very tiny. I managed to squeeze a bed into it. Wish I hadn't done it because now I can't get it out uh, unless it's standed up, stood up on its end or taken apart completely. But this is my ocean room and it was for an event that I had here uh, where we were on an ocean liner and we had activities as though we were on a trip. And, uh, so I just left it this way, and the children, the descendants that come, just love to sleep in here. In fact, I even have an ocean recording where they can push the button uh, by their bedside and hear the waves <laughs> for this room. But um, I have so much to do, and I'm sure you do too. And so a lot of times I would get up and just hit the floor running and I'd never bother uh, to get dressed just running around in my pajamas and maybe later on change but now I get dressed I'm not comfortable unless I'm dressed and uh, and have everything and have fixed uh, my hair as best I can and done what I can to look fresh band box brush and if I don't get everything done in my house I, it's very frustrating, isn't it, to start on a room, but you only do it halfway because something else has to be done or it's time to fix a meal or it's time to do something else. At least I will not be half-dressed or half-done. I'll, ha I'll be completed. At least I will look um, like I'm ready for the job. So that's really important. You can, get, you can have things in your home that aren't quite finished, but you will always be finished. And you need to work towards that goal to always uh, to say I've been dressed first thing in the morning uh, so many days in a row and that even though may, you may not think you have time for it, it's like other things like exercise and prayer and making a list and having your cup of tea. You don't think you have time for it because the work is so prominently staring at you and screaming at you. And but. When you do those things, those little preparation things, the prayer, the, the list, the uh, bathing and dressing and and the, uh, the cup of tea to start out with, all those things seem to make the other jobs a little bit more clear. You have more clarity. You can approach them without confusion and frustration. That's so important. So I would suggest if you have not got dressed to go and do that. I like to make a list and I like to uh, check off things. And so even if some days all I manage to do <laughs> is get up and I put an X in that box makes me feel pretty good. And uh, so that is one of the reasons that I like to dress. And I think that uh, also I'm into textiles. I like fabrics. I have always loved sewing and I will put some pictures on the blog post on which I have embedded this um, narrative and show you uh, some of the homemaking um, outfits that I've seen on Pinterest and you can go to my Pinterest and find them. Uh, I have the link on the left on that blog and I'm always working on that and but I will try to put some on the blog here for those of you that don't go to Pinterest and show you some of the fabrics and clothes and things that people, they I think it's really neat the women that sew or the women that like to um, dress for homemaking will take a picture of themselves in one of these rooms, like uh, in the kitchen, in the dining room, in the living room, making a bed, and they'll have a picture. They've managed to have these beautiful pictures made. Um, doing that task dressed up is just charming, and I will put it on the blog for you. And I want to give uh, I want to give my house uh, the manse the best my best 
while I'm here. And uh, I'm not waiting for things to improve in the world because it's not going to be. And those of you who are vital know that, don't you? You know by now it's always going to be that way. They're always going to be busy creating chaos for you so that you're stunned and you can't move and you can't do anything and your heart has stopped and you're just waiting for the war in this place to get better and the, and the war over here to get better and you can't do that because you know I know you think I'm a conspiracy theorist but we've seen it all before haven't we and they like to play this game with your mind and keep you going remember the quote that I gave you in a previous video I think I can almost memorize it Douglas MacArthur famous generals under Eisenhower said everywhere we go there is this uh, fear that we're all going to be gobbled up and uh, that uh, that the nations are going to be at war with us and uh, he talked about it in a quote and I will put that there for you again you need to remember that it's history those of you who are homeschooling need to have some of those quotes of Douglas MacArthur because he was on to them and particularly the media now when I talk about um, being prepared and relaxed and happy for your home that's what dressing is all about dress to be happy dress to be content and dress to be uh, at peace and relaxed wear something that makes you feel good and uh, when I talk about that I also think that it's really important to I wrote it down here someone let me think something about uh, your mental immune system I made that up your mental immune system and we talk about our physical immune system it's your out it, it starts with your outer layer of skin that's your immune system that's why I say to keep yourself healthy and because whatever you see on the outside is probably indic indicative of what's going on the, on the inside and your mental immune system is so important you have to have some kind of mental immunity against the onslaught of bad news and also not just that let's just say you don't listen to any bad news you don't read it and you're not really up on it politics or anything like that nothing like that disturbs you but there may be a criticism of you and it can just slay you you've got to build up a, a proper immune system a proper mental immune system against that and there are there's techniques that people use which I'd like to talk about in the end to uh, to knock you over and reduce your confidence and uh, that's where there's nothing new under the sun this has just gone on since forever you know and so it's very important to build up your mental immune system and that is why uh, you have reading material that you like I, I like to read uh, parts of wives and daughters and of course the Word of God and I have other interests too uh, it's not all about cleaning it's not all about just uh, you know the mechanicalness of running a home uh, I believe that God wants us to have uh, interests things that we are interested in and I have too many <laughs> Um, and sometimes I get a chance to do some of them so when you dress up remember to say to yourself I'm starting a new day it's a new life and I'm a new person don't you feel that way when you get dressed in something new and clean and, and you are all like a new canvas too that you're going to paint on today especially your mind and your emotions and you know homemakers do run their homes on emotion because we aren't just uh, working for someone and it's over at five o'clock and it's just a job we're doing this for the emotional well-being of the people in our home and we're doing it out of the goodness of our hearts and our personal feeling of responsibility and a lot of people can't understand that but the way we say uh, we should be paid the way I pay myself is to have uh, things in order to dress up and to have peace of mind that to me is a great payment and also keeps you from getting poor because of wanting to run out and relieve yourself of stress uh, by uh, which always costs more money <laughs> and um, so I think I've probably gone on and on and on about it about being dressed and being presentable and I will add some things to my blog so that you can one of the reasons I want you to go to the link 
is because then you will see what a, a pictures I put on there to go with what I have been talking about. Now, when it comes to homemaking, I like to include that maybe like in the middle of the broadcast, but uh, you can find out different methods of homemaking. There's, there's Fly Lady if you get uh, really bogged down, and there are other people online that do a very good job of helping, and so everybody has their own problems with their own home. I'm in an older home. It's always got something that needs to be uh, fixed or repaired, covered up, or disguised. And uh, so I'm not going to be able to give you really good information about homemaking, except that it is an honor and a duty at the same time. Now, I wanted to bring up one thing that I remembered. I like to play Remember When. So one of the things that I remembered was this McCall's Cooking School. Does anybody remember that? It was a, a book or a magazine that you could get every month or so. And for the first time in my life, now I had all the old cookbooks uh, from the old days, but this was the first time I'd ever seen a step-by-step -step, uh, photographic or it might have even been just drawn, sketched out illustration of how to put together a meal. And it would start with the raw cuts of vegetables or whatever, and it would show the next step and the next step, and then it would show it being um, prepared and cooked and served. And in all these little squares on this page, I was just fascinated with it, and I became a better cook. And I was looking at those the other day. They're still available. You can still buy them. They're called McCall's Cooking School. I'm sure they're used, but uh, for those of you who want a little more guidance, those are wonderful. And I, uh, first of all, let me back up here because I wanted to go back to exercise and how important that is to have your stretches in the morning. And I am following or I'm using Lucy Wyndham Reed in England. I'll put that uh, link there for one of her. She calls them snacks, exercise snacks, which means you take a break during the day and do a little exercise, maybe um, just a little pushing against the wall or raising your arms, and they're called snacks. I love it, and uh, I just love what, what people invent, and that's one of the reasons I invent a lot of things is that I feel like uh, that it's just easier to remember. So she has these exercise snacks, and I have been doing them, and it's just a minute or two throughout the day, different ways, and it's almost like stealth sipping where nobody knows you're actually doing it as you lean down pick up something to stretch a little further or put something away and uh and just uh tighten your muscles things like that so i will leave you a link to one of her exercise snacks that you can do and uh people have told me that they have followed her and lost some weight and uh just feel so good their posture has improved um and things that they didn't think they things they thought they were stuck with and I've heard women say that uh, when your arms get really big and flabby, that'll never go away. That's not true. Some women have told me they have reduced that. The other thing was, you know, you can develop a, a little bit of a stoop or a hump on your back, and that can actually go away. People say it can't. Other people will say when you just get really um, overweight in your chest or stomach, that will never go away. That's not true either. Um, so following some of these can be helpful and also improve your mood at home. But, of all the exercise people that I have followed, I found the same pattern throughout. Even the ones that just do uh, do stretches and, you know, slow type exercises, I have found the same things over and over. And they were contained back in the... I believe back in the 60s, these two uh, magazines, these two books for, for boys, uh, Christian boys and girls, this one was the Christian Charm Course and this was the Man in Demand. And they had, each of them had this little uh, six, six exercises in them and I uh, photographed it and put it in plastic. And every one of them, as I look back, when I go find a new exercise online, I think I'll follow this one for a while, and they'll have a seven-day challenge, which I just love things like that, where they put you on a seven-day schedule, and you do this you do this seven-day thing that they have. Uh, it all goes back to these basic exercises. So I love it that these are drawn out, 
uh, because I don't have to uh, follow anything. But you could you could do that and uh, you know copy them from a book. We used to be able to have exercises from books, and someone online has printed or published the uh, Victorian exercises. And there was the one that was about uh, you know exercises that made you uh, were like pouring tea and uh, different things like that. And I think I mentioned it in a previous video. And uh, this Lucy Wintem that I have been using recently, she is very clever. She will say, put your hands together and then act like you're stirring a big soup. Or she'll say, uh, she'll have you seated and she'll say, act like you're rowing. And, uh, and those are very old fashioned and I just love it. And I wanted to show you that in homemaking, it's always good to have these little perks and these little, I guess call them tools or call them supplies. And I was telling you about these McCall's Cooking School uh, where they illustrated things uh, step by step so that you could make something. Well, this is very similar to Cook's Illustrated. I don't know if your country has this or if this is just at my local grocery store, but it's called Cook's Illustrated. And they have the very kind of the very same thing, but it's all sketched out, which is kind of nice. And I'll show you how to do things that, uh, and, and it is it is rather, if I had a school at Ashcombe, this would be one of your workbooks. <laughs> and you would have a, a blank book that went with it. And uh, it just, I just love what, I just love the sketches and illustrations and step by step. They do have step by step, and um, they have like one to eight here steps. Uh, it's not as nice as the McCall's Cooking School that I remember. Please leave me a comment if you remember those, and that will show how vital you are. Um, and then this one here, uh, each issue has tools, uh, a page about two different tools in it. You can really get quite absorbed in all this. And, and when all is said and done, no one really needs uh, someone with a lot of talent that can uh, do something to entertain you. They really need cooks and plumbers <laughs> and people that can get the ice off of the doorstep. So these are skills we all need to to have and um, so then here's another one cooks illustrated seems like this one has is about different kinds of pears i was going to just show you these step-by-step -step things in here if i can find an illustration that's um, available and every now and then they'll put out one that is uh a real thick one, all-time recipes, and these are old-fashioned. I like their old-fashioned drawings on the back where they'll show things that cooks used to use, heirloom kitchen tools and the sketches of that. And uh, they just have so, so many hints on um, how to make the food the best you can and almost gourmet. And so, like I say, uh, whatever you need to make your life better at home, I think you should give yourself. These are these are the rewards and the this is the payment is some of these things. Now you might look at it as work, but I don't always buy these because to 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 do anything in them. I'm entertained by just reading about it, the recipe and what to do. And uh, I do the same thing with patterns for sewing. Sometimes I'll sit down and just read the instructions to see how it's put together. It entertains me, and I may not ever make it, but that's what I like to do. Another thing you might want to know, some of you who are homeschooling, or if you're homeschooling yourself, you might want to know about these, uh, the recent Victoria magazine, which is um, supposed to be for winter. It has an interesting uh, article in it. I always liked it because they did a lot of architecture and flower arrangements, antiques and things like that. And you could use this if you, even if you're raising boys and teaching boys, there's a lot in here about different countries and different parts of the country and just uh, history in it. If that's all you had, you could do this. And during the ice storm, when we weren't going to go anywhere, I was so glad that I had got this. Someone had uh, subscribed to it for me, and I was so glad I got it. 
but they have something on in here on journaling. And it, uh, I don't know what the title of it is, but I wanted to show you how they used watercolor. Now, I prefer to use watercolor when writing a letter. Uh, that way I don't have to make a big painting or anything. It's not going to be tedious for me. I'm writing to somebody, but they must have got the idea from me because they have in here a letter with a watercolor painting on it. You could teach your children to do this. So they could just take this and look at it and, and, uh, and use it as an example. And they have all kinds of, uh, like I said, old architecture and buildings. You could get a lot out of here. They also have entertaining uh, recipes and uh, different things. And could be both for, for anyone in the family. Or maybe you just want to do it for you. For those of you who want to get into watercolor, um, I don't do it as much as I, I want to. Mainly, uh, I'm busy writing things to my descendants. So that's where, I'll, that's where I'll use my watercolor. But at the Dollar Tree, you can get these artists' books. And that's to me, that's the best paper because you don't because it's only $1.25. You don't have to worry about uh, whether you mess up or not or have to tear out a page or start over. They always have uh, an illustration on the, on the inside cover of uh, how to draw something step by step. I like that. And another thing that I do that you might... Uh, want to consider. I don't know. We used, we didn't always uh, have these plastic pages, but back in the back in the day. But I have them now. And what I do is, if I find something that came in the mail that I like, that I might use in some way, like for uh, for a theme or an idea to paint or draw, or just you know for homemaking or for decorating. Uh, and then I liked, I liked this. Uh, this dress and I think I might make it. I've got some of that fabric, this purple, and I just will take, uh, tear them out of catalogs and put them in a little paper like this for my idea book. So let me see what else I have to say to you today. And I hope you're getting a lot done while you listen. Okay, I have a... Uh, I have an anecdote for you today. Oh, before I do that, I don't know how many of you like Jane Austen and have watched all the 1990s Jane Austen series movies, um, but uh, my family just loves them. I have memorized all the scripts. Uh, and every summer, uh, I noticed on YouTube, various women in England and maybe some in the States do Jane Austen's summer program. And I don't know if it's connected to a university or if it's just something that uh, just is independent. And uh, if you know anything about that, let me know. But I, what I discerned from it is it's just a, a, something that has a list of things to do. They might meet together on Zoom. They might make a costume to go with uh, a certain book that they're reading. Uh, they might also uh, write essays, and they may read aloud, and they may also invent games or, uh, you know, do spin-offs of these stories and uh, of other activities. Go for a Jane Austen walk. Um, eat a Jane Austen meal, have Jane Austen tea and all this. And it's a, like a program, a summer program. And I got to looking at some of that and wondering why no one had done uh, Wives and Daughters because it's delightful. So if I were to have a school at Ashcombe and literature, we would start with, uh, we would do Wives and Daughters and we might even do a, uh, a woman of uh, the Bible. And there's so much. I wrote down a number of things that could be done. Uh, read aloud every day and or read to yourself and then divide it into things that you notice like uh, like they do with the Jane Austen is they would observe descriptions of rooms or, or the clothing that they wore or the food that they ate or conversation styles. I'll have a lot of fun with the conversation 
and you could almost spend uh, half an hour talking back to each other just using quotes out of some of these books, which is a lot of fun. And uh, that's what I would do. I also have reading comprehension. I don't know if you have noticed, ladies, that people are having a hard time comprehending even conversation, or if you're having if you're having a if you're reading something like from the Bible and they totally get it out of proportion and and they just totally don't see the main the main point. If you remember, comprehension was who, what, when, where, why, how, uh, and and other things too. Like when you're reading something, you have to always read what was written before that particular paragraph and was written afterwards so you can take in context. You have to learn the word context, things like that. So we would we would learn what context meant or we would learn um, what the setting was either in the Bible or any other thing that you were reading. And so that would be fun. We could also do a little art on the subject. We could do uh, Elizabeth Gaskell art and uh, we would also, I think, if you have children that are old enough for wives and daughters, you should absorb them, get them absorbed in watching the Wives and Daughters uh, series. Uh, I've got them myself. I didn't bring them in here for you to see. But it's very important to watch because there is a, there is a lot going on in that. And they did a pretty good job because I'm reading the book and in the uh, descriptions and things almost match the uh, movies very, just almost perfectly. But one thing that probably I would do besides uh, the setting and the time and the, you know what the year was and uh, what was going on in the world at the time um, and the personality, different personalities, like of Molly and of her stepsister Cynthia and of her stepmother and of her father and of Roger Hamley and his brother and Mrs. Hamley and Mr. Hamley and Lady Cumner and all these people to describe them. I would also show the uh, the gains and losses that went on in these this book. Because from the beginning, my impression was that here's a little girl that starts out with a loss. And it's like uh, the book of Job, where he said, we brought nothing into this world and we'll take nothing out. And the book of Job shows um, a great loss and then great gain. And yet he never, ever turned his back on God. And we see with Molly here. She starts out with a loss. She doesn't have a mother. Her mother died many years before and she uh, doesn't know anything except to be with her father. They've never been apart and uh, gradually you see that she starts to suffer some more losses because her father wants to get married again and she's sorry for it. Roger said and you're sorry for it. <laughs> and uh, then of course there are many other things that go on where she, you can see where she's, it looks like she's just going to lose. And then in the end, uh, things pick up and look better. But her attitude was good. And she she just seemed to have a confidence and a faith that things were going to, were going to be all right. And Roger, of course, is the same way. He says, we can't just judge things at the moment. We've got to wait and, and give things a chance to work out. That's what he said. And uh, so as my time is going on here, I want to be sure that I don't miss anything. And I have a uh, little anecdote for you that I talked to you about. And it's from, now I will just read this to you and then I'll write, uh, have you look it up or I'll write it down on the blog because I seem to be getting looking on the wrong card or something and making the wrong citation. But this is what it says. It's an anecdote to anxiety, which our uh, society is just beleaguered with. We're just It's just like an attack. It's like a war. So much anxiety. And it isn't just the news media. It's the families. Very few people in politics are actually talking about preserving your families and keeping your uh, children loyal to their homes and families and keeping everybody from making sudden drastic decisions that upset everybody. And nobody talks about this. 
and in wives and daughters you can see it happening and and how uh, the dread people feel when other people in their lives do something that's upsetting and and how they cope with it but here's an anecdote to any anxiety you may have I used to meet people who women especially who had suffered great anxiety over things that had happened to them and, and losses and uh, and things that weren't their fault at all and they were unable to they were unable to recover at all and yet they had such beauty around them beautiful homes uh, that they owned and uh, they had nice families and things like that but when you're hit with something you can't see it and this is one thing that uh, I have to say this is one of the most helpful scriptures I have ever seen and we'll break it down so you can understand it um, do not be anxious about anything I used to look at that and think now wait a minute it just uh, just by command don't be anxious about anything we're supposed to let go of this anxiety that won't let go of us and it just keeps pumping up the fear and the adrenaline and the dread and uh, but just just read on what the what the answer is do not be anxious for anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God I think the little appreciation moments that someone invented and I've taken up the call stop and appreciate every time a little anxiety comes on uh, it, it blinds us to things that we can appreciate stop and be thankful for something even if it's just uh, the roof over your head <laughs> that's not leaking uh, even if it's just a little rock outside of your doorway even if it's just the fact that you've got something to wear today or there's food in your fridge stop and be thankful for something uh, anyway even if it doesn't strike you as particularly inspiring uh, stop and be thankful that you're able to um, get up and walk <laughs> wake up in the morning get out of bed um, stop and every with every bit of stress the anecdote is the thankfulness is the uh, appreciation moment just stop and do that and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus sure um, everybody has kids and grandkids that are making sudden wrong decisions and being pulled into things that they shouldn't be and it is distressing especially to parents who have uh, born them put everything into them um, you know a lady that I know keeps telling me their cells are still in your body <laughs> and naturally you're bonded to them and naturally uh, you you shed tears and you pray over them yes uh, but the anxiety uh, that seizes up your body and makes you sick gives you a headache and keeps you from sleeping and eating and you, you can't you can't really make any progress in life because of this um, anxiety which kind of stops you in your tracks it can be alleviated by prayer and thanksgiving and I just would like to challenge you it's like if you have scary we used to tell the kids you know if you have scary thoughts or bad thoughts substitute them each time with a good thought or a happy thought or if you have dread or depression uh, stop and think how you would really like life to be substitute that you know that uh, that beautiful thought of how you would like to have things uh, whether or not uh, you have everything the way you want it or not stop and just think about it because it's good whatever's good whatever's lovely the Bible says so and the, here's the promise the peace of God this is after you have not been you have substituted everything with prayer and supplication with Thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God so whether or not you think it's actually going to happen sometimes we have a little doubt like Dear God, I wish you would uh, help uh, so-and-so's cousin, whatever. And then deep in your heart, you're thinking, I don't see how in the world that could ever change. Uh, you can't do that because it says, let your requests be made known to God and then leave it alone. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This will take some practice. This will take some practice. And then it goes on to that famous verse, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, it says finally. So that's finally. You know, I know I've had this scripture told to me so many times. Uh, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, think on these things. But what about the verse I just read to you that came before? I think that that is a prerequisite to that. I think it's important to pay attention to the previous verse and uh, substitute um, these, this prayer and thanksgiving for every anxious thought. And I think particularly for the homemaker, they feel it more because they're putting their life into, they're laying down their lives for their children for their husbands, for their families, and somehow don't think that they should suffer any failure. And um, so it makes them anxious. But um, we were told when we were growing up, and you don't hear this anymore, do you? I think I spoke about it in my previous uh, broadcast, that life has to go on. And that's why I think that the getting prepared and then starting to work on your house. And if you don't have anyone and people are all mad at you and they seem to have dropped you, no one's phoning you, no one's texting you, um, your kids won't talk to you, your grandkids are busy, um, and everybody just seems to have forgotten you, then that's when you can uh, put your mind and your life into self-improvement because now there's nobody to distract you and they're going to leave you alone. <laughs> So how to use isolation as an opportunity for improvement. So no matter what happens to you, Titus 2, where it says that the uh, women should guard the home and guide the home, love their husband, love their children, um, and the other scriptures that talk about keeping house so that the word of God be not blasphemed or discredited, and um, so no matter what, Titus 2 has to be, it's still to be followed. You, you don't take, you don't say, well, this has happened, that's happened, I'm going to forget it. Because if you have housework to do, that can probably save your sanity. Because as you neaten up things and clean up things, it's like a self-care gift. Because it puts you at ease to have things done. So... How to use isolation as an opportunity for improvement. Well, that's when you can start reading. That's when you can start developing character and knowledge and new skills and maybe creative things, doing creative things. Um, and so some of these things, it's best for you to experience yourself, but you can use, when people isolate you, go back to that scripture I read and uh, thank God for something. And uh, prayer, pray whatever you hope for or dream for. The Bible also says that he's able to exceedingly abundantly um, give us uh, beyond what we ask for. Uh, do that and then ask God to guide you into something that will benefit you and benefit others. And that is um, to develop your creative skills or your character, your knowledge and, and improve your life. And I knew, I've known people who've had devastations in their lives. But after the initial shock got busy, of course, this was back beyond before um, people knew about post-traumatic stress dis uh, syndrome, before people knew about the uh, sundowners uh, syndrome, before people knew about, well, they actually did know about it because they always talked about how I can tell, uh, you know, that my mood has changed because the sun has gone down or something like that. Um, they, they started, after the initial shock, would often start something. Like they would start to improve uh, something in their house or outside of their house or something that they needed to do. And uh, I've known people that started whole, um, whole hobbies that were very, very impressive because of some devastating thing that had happened to them. And that's why I always say take some appreciation moments, some appreciation time. I don't want to call it snacks because somebody else already used that. 
overcome. And give your time and your energy uh, into the job that God set before you. If you have a home life, if you have a home, then there, your work is set out before you. Now, I wanted to say one more thing about uh, about literature. And um, just want to check over my notes and make sure that I didn't miss anything. Oh, yes. I wanted to talk a little bit about courtesy because I always like to cover this, especially if you're homeschooling. Um, but maybe you're just homeschooling yourself. And that was this... Uh, Hasty sharp replies that I have referred to in past uh, broadcasts that seems to be a problem where people will come in right when you're still talking and and jump right in and, and draw a conclusion, or, which can be very, very, um, it can be so sharp that it puts you off and you kind of shrink back. Um, these hasty sharp replies. Now, I think it's really important to give a truthful reply. And who was it that said, I want a truthful reply from you? Was it uh, Anna Green Gables? Uh, was it Marilla? She said, now, Anne, I want a truthful reply from you. Uh, I think it's very important to be straight and to have a truthful reply. But I think that it has to be done with tact. And to give a hasty, sharp reply... Um, can really make the answer have a sting in it, or it, it feels more poisonous than than a blessing. So I think that maybe that is one reason why Jesus said, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And don't swear, and do not lie to one another. And we live in a culture of, I don't want to say it's lying, but they give you a half of the information, or they give you other information that you don't need just in order to fog over the real answer. I don't know if you've ever experienced hearing that. And that's why we should say yes or no. And uh, if we can, you know. And if you watch, uh, and I see uh, people that are supposed to be professionals, I see them in uh, Congress or Parliament or something, they won't answer directly anything. They go round and round and round with long explanations and uh, send your mind off, off in a different direction. And um, so I really think it's important to say yes or no, especially if you're raising children, and uh, for them, and to be gentle and, uh, and not s s um, spout off quick, sharp replies, but to, but to be... Um, but to be compassionate and kind and to answer civilly. And in order to answer civilly, it's not necessary to be sharp. I don't know how I could explain this, but it would be fun if I had a school at Ashkin to role play this and have a little play where someone, uh, where there be uh, a staged, staged play and, and then have the audience analyze how it made you feel with the sharp person answering and the one person who is being thoughtful and yet truthful. And also uh, how it made you feel to see uh, maybe somebody could write a script uh, where people weren't actually answering properly or they weren't answering yes or no or they were too sharp or they were uh, maybe not quite being truthful. We live in a in a culture of that that's very difficult, isn't it? Um, so build up your mental immune system. Watch this. Uh, listen to this video and read that scripture. Uh, it was in Philippians chapter four, and it was the first before eight. You know, we always talk about Philippians four eight. Whatever is lovely, think on these things. God knows it's good for your mind and your body. But the previous one was, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's your anecdote. There's your answer. Every time you get a distressing thought, go to this and pray and give thanks for something. 
And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It takes a lot of practice to get there, especially if your body and mind have been pumping adrenaline most of your life, or if you were just born anxious. It takes a while. So ladies, I hope that this has helped in some way and that you have got uh, something done. Let me just go to one more thing. I know it's been over an hour. You can always pause, you know. But I had this... Uh, Someone told me about a little, I forget what you call it, it's a tactic or a technique, uh, where I think that we need to also teach our, our children and our, uh, our ladies classes and everything how to handle this because you'll get this is technique where things can devolve into a very unpleasant conversation or argument and how they do it. So we want to know how they do it. They may not know they're doing this. It starts with either a contradiction or an accusation. And we, being wanting to have a clear conscience, will try to uh, clear that up and uh, maybe uh, try to make things right. But they're not happy with it. So they start to uh, escalate it. Uh, they'll get a little louder to cover up the fact that uh, they don't want to, uh, they don't want to accept your sincere uh, apology or whatever. Then they start to distract, but they, I forget who it was I watched one time was saying, uh, you shouldn't, someone had aggravated someone else, and uh, the lady said, you know, you shouldn't take a sleeping dog by the ears. And that's from the Proverbs, but I think Poirot did a, did a good job of it when, in one of the Agatha Christie stories, and uh, said, in his Belgian way, do not uh, pick up a sleepy dog by the ears or something like that. And so the person, instead of trying to understand the proverb, said, are you calling me a dog? So they distract. And then there's an argument about whether or not you did that. And then they change the subject. And then they argue. Then they wear you down. Then they stress you so that you give up. And uh, you've lost all of your energy. You've, uh, you're, you're exhausted. Your mind is so stunned you can't think anymore. You can't focus and that sort of thing. And these are uh, tactics. And so if you know about this, then the less time you can spend on uh, and the more cheerful and positive you can be. And that's why I say, you know, it's really good to be dressed up because if these things happen to you or someone attacks you or something like that, I'm talking about verbally, at least you have this dignity, this kind of a dignity about you. And uh, so the less time you can spend on getting involved with people who are have an agenda of just wearing you down or stressing you out, uh, remember in these books by Jane Austen, whenever there was a, an impending argument, somebody would say, ah, I see the tea is here. Let us go and have some. That is just so good. And I also wanted to say that I've been reading this one, Emma, that some people like to stress other people out. Or they, they don't know they're doing it. They're just going to have it. But Emma, I believe, stressed Harriet out. Here was Harriet. She was a simple girl. And she was happy with uh, the friendship of this farmer that she thought might be interested in her. And Emma got her all stressed out over Mr. Elton. Well, Mr. Elton might be interested in her. He's a higher level. And, and Harriet ended up in tears over the whole situation and stressed out. Uh, and Emma has stressed her out. So watch about other people putting ideas in your head and discouraging you from being what you want to be or need to be um, for your home and for your family. And uh, don't take on other people's other people's stress. So ladies, and, and just go back to that verse. And uh, I hope that you'll stay close to Christ. And keep praying for me that I can get here more often. And uh, I'm hoping you're having a wonderful time, that you got a lot done while you listened today. Thank you very much for all you do for me and for um, finding the right verses for me <laughs> when I uh, misquote the 
sometimes I misquote the uh, actual place to find them, but at least I can quote the verse. So I will talk to you later. I love you. Bye.